of tribe. Amen, amen. I want you to tell two people right now, don't sit down, just tell people right now and say, we serve a great, great God. Amen. Great, great God. Yes, I am. Oh, lift your hand. 
hands and praise him right now, church. You are a child of the king. Oh, we've got so much to praise him for tonight. He's not forsaken us. He's not forgotten us. We are his children tonight. Amen. Come on, lift your hands and praise him. Hallelujah. Lord, we've come to worship you tonight. We've come to praise you tonight because we know that you're our heavenly father and that we're your children. And God, your word says you'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, somebody get excited about that. Amen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Say that again. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am one more time. Now I am chosen, not forsaken. Amen. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free in me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. In my Father's house, there's a place for Lift your hand, church. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Now, come on, let's praise him in this house. Let's praise him in this house. Amen, amen. 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 God bless you. you. may be seated. Thank you so much for joining us this evening on this Wednesday night. Those of you who are watching by live stream, we uh, welcome you. We have an exciting guest speaker this evening. Sue Becker uh, started Becker's Bread many years ago. She and her husband Brad are here to uh, offer us some vital information. Here's what the Bible says. Exodus chapter 23, verse 25. The Lord spoke to Israel and said, I will bless your bread and your water. And so it's pretty awesome and amazing to think that the children of Israel spent 40 years and their feet didn't swell their shoes didn't wear out. Now, I know that depresses some ladies. You'd have the same pair of shoes for 40 years. But it's pretty awesome, pretty amazing, our God. And he's given us everything that we need to walk in health and to be whole. So Sue's going to come in just a minute and share with us uh, from a scientific standpoint, from a biological standpoint, the power of this bread uh, that we have access to every single day. And Barbara and I have been eating it, I think, about nine years now. So we grind our own wheat, make our own bread. Barbara does it twice a week. And uh, it's just phenomenal. We share it with our other uh, family members, our daughters and our son. And they love this bread. It's been one of the smartest choices we've made for our health. We're going to worship the Lord through giving and an offering. If our ushers will come and help me. We thank the Lord for the privilege of being able to sow seed in his kingdom and to be a part of what he's doing. And so we bring the best that we have. It's off the top. One-tenth of everything God blesses us with is called the tithe. And in addition to the tithe, we bring offerings as we sow sacrificial gifts in the kingdom. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, thank you so much that you're with those in our community of faith who are in the hospital today, those who have just come home, we know that Eddie Fitz will be returning home on Friday. And so we just ask you, God, to be with Charles Freeman as he continues to struggle with this UTI and uh, E. coli. And so we just ask you for a miracle healing in his body right now. Also, Tracy Green will be having surgery tomorrow, and so we lift her up to you and pray in advance that you would guide the hands of these surgeons, the doctors, the nurses, be with them, and uh, just bless Stan tonight, God. Give him special grace to care for his spouse. We thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Receive the offering that we present before you, the tithe that we bring in return to you. We pray that everything that's said and done here tonight 
would honor you. Bless Sue in a supernatural way. This is such a great daughter of God that you have given insight and wisdom and knowledge. And she's taken her time, along with her husband, to share with us this evening about this incredible bread. Mm. We thank you for her and Brad and just pray blessing over them and all their family and grandchildren. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody shout, Amen. Amen. God bless you this evening as you give. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to come here tonight. Um, I, uh, I hope you, uh, my hope is to bring a message of in, that will enlighten you and at the same time encourage you. And I promise it will be a message like you've never heard in church before. Just, just believe me, we'll get there. And um, I have a personal conviction of wearing a head covering whenever I speak or teach in public and from God's word. Um, doesn't, no one in my church does it, so it's not a, a, a denominational thing of the church I go to. It's just a conviction that the Lord showed me of having my head covered as a sign of authority um, for God and my husband and, and the teaching that I'm going to bring. So um, I just, again, I just want to thank you uh, for allowing me to be here tonight. Uh, my husband and I started a business, The Bread Beckers, in 1992. Um, after I was introduced to the concept of milling my own grain and making my own bread and the health benefits. And um, as a, I'm a food scientist, I graduated from the University of Georgia. Still crying a little bit after Saturday, but we're okay. We're good. We're here. So, um, and those of you that don't know, just don't worry about it. So go dogs. That's all I'm going to say. But um, anyway, um, uh, introduced to the concept of milling my own grain and the health benefits behind it. And as a food science major, I had never thought of this. I thought that what they were doing to our food was a great thing. But when I learned the history of white flour and how the common diseases that affect this nation are directly related to our consumption of this bread, it made perfect scientific sense to me because of my studies in biochemistry and physiology. I continued to study after I left college, and then in 1992, when we started our business, continued to study as I hear testimonies from other people, and myself had many testimonies. And my lecture is six hours long, the whole lecture, so we're gonna, um, I'm gonna go really fast and condense it. I think we are going to 8.30 though, right? He gave me an extra little bit, so, um, but I'll try not, not to bore you too much. Um, oh, and he's, Brad's starting me right now. So um, <clears throat> anyway, but it, like I said, in, um, so we started our business because of the testimonies and the things that we heard. We're from Woodstock, Georgia. We have a company called the Bread Beckers. We teach cooking classes, and I teach and speak all over the country. We have some cooking classes coming up. I have um, informational material on both of the Welcome Center um, desks. You're welcome to get those. Uh, we have the class sheet is the green sheet. We have a class coming up this Saturday. So if you love what you hear, you're like, oh, I got to go, come on over. And the classes are like 12 bucks and we feed you all day long. It's a getting started bread making class. We'll show you all about the grains, but we have some other things. And then um, several of you have asked me about the CDs, the whites, they're both free. The white CD is kind of what you're going to hear tonight. I'm always learning. So there might be some new information or there might be a little bit, but it's basically what you'll hear tonight. The red CD is a rebuttal of the anti-grain, anti-gluten, anti-wheat, anti-bread propaganda that's out there, the myth of all of that. So grab that. There's some brochures. I also have a ministry. I'm so passionate about what we're doing. We want to make sure everyone has access to this bread. And in 2016, God called me to Haiti, and we have uh, raised up. I've been training, made my ninth trip um, in September to Haiti in just the last two years. We've raised up young men that are baking bread for 1,600 school children every day, made out of freshly ground whole grain. Promise you, if these high school boys can do it, you can do it. So, and they do it after school. I love the scripture that Pastor Steve shared. Um, Exodus 23, 25 is one of my verses. God says to Israel, I will bless your bread and I will bless your water. And the rest of that verse goes on to say, and I will take sickness from the midst of you. It's a powerful, 
powerful promise. And um, in my travels over the last 26 years, I've realized that um, though we live in the wealthiest nation in the world, we're the sickest nation in the developed world, chronically sick. And we tend to treat symptoms and not disease and not the root of the problem. And as I've traveled, I've, I find this to be very true. Everywhere I'm meeting people, have friends, loved ones, or they themselves have some kind of serious health issue that they're dealing with, or maybe you're just constipated, and I did say that in church, and it's going to get worse from there. But anyway, um, it may, or just stuffy nose, digestive issues, you've got kids that just snotty noses, ear infections, stay sick all the time. I'm with you. I've been there, and I've done that. Brad and I have been married 43 years. I have nine children, seven I birthed, two we adopted. I have 12 grandchildren, and I, so I've been at this a, a long time, and I uh, have my share of snotty noses and health issues and doctor visits and all of that. But I am here today to tell you that in 1991, when I was introduced to the concept of milling my own grain and making my own bread and the history of white flour and how the bread that we're eating today came to be and the common diseases that plagued this nation and how it was directly related to the bread we were eating, I was blown away. So I'm an all or nothing kind of person. I'm pretty passionate. You're going to get that by the end of this message. So I got a grain mill for my birthday after I read that, and that mill came into our home. It was the only change in our diet I made at the time, but we went all the way. White flour has not been in my home since 1991, except maybe to make Play-Doh. It's the only thing it's good for, so just, you know. But it came in, and we changed. Every bit of the bread we eat, we ate was made. I, I milled my flour fresh, and... Um, I, I made all of our bread, cakes, cookies, pancakes, everything. And um, it's so funny. When I first started this, we were going to a little church and coming, and I'd take bread to church, and it was, people would, you know, they'd come on, they'd go, oh, my goodness, this bread is so delicious. And uh, they'd say, can I get the recipe? And I'm like, well, I grind my own flour, you know, to make this bread. I kid you not. They would go, you do what? That was the first question. I would say, I grind my own flour. And then they'd go, Oh, second question. Don't, it took me a long time to figure this one out. Second question, where do you live? <laughs> I think it started this picture of a barn and the, the grain, the stone mill and the ox going around. And I don't know if they thought I was the ox or that I must have lived on a farm that had an ox. So I had to tell them, no, it's this little machine. It's about this big. And you put the grain in here and it comes out flour here and it grinds. You know, you just pour it in, turn it on. It's as easy as taking the canister out of the cabinet and it grinds a pound of flour in less than 30 seconds. So it was, it was easy. And um, so I tell everybody it's an easy lifestyle to incorporate. But it came into our home, and I do have to tell people, too, that we were eating pretty healthy. I'm a real food kind of person. There, I grew up Southern, so mealtime at our house was meat and vegetables, eggs, toast, grits. You know, we just, we just ate real, meatloaf and mashed potatoes, you know. But the bread we were eating was whatever was in the store. So this changed everything. Well, all I can tell you, the health benefits to me personally were very immediate, very noticeable, very significant. Now, this first thing I know y'all really want to know this. First month, actually first day, Mill came in, made bread, ate bread, and I pooped the next morning. <laughs> I'm sorry, just gonna say it like it is. Constipation was immediately gone for me. And America's the most constipated nation in the world. I'm not sure how they found that out, but they are. And I was right there. Gone, done, finished, never had to take any medication, nothing. I eat my bread and I go. Energy, my energy levels went up. When I first started in 1991, I had five young children. I homeschooled my children. Um, we went to church, we did baseball, we had youth group, we did all those things, went on to have number six, number seven, and then we adopted to not too many years ago. When your energy levels go up, you notice when you got all that going on, and I always seem to have a nursing baby, and anyway, so my energy levels went up, frequent headaches went away. Um, <laughs> I just always seemed to have pressure in my head. Um, didn't have to take a lot of medication, but I always just seemed to have a headache. Those all went away, and I honestly 
Just last week, I actually, two weeks ago, I had, I really think the flu, the first headache I've had, and I can't remember when. And um, I went in to see if we even had Advil, and we did. It expired in 2016, so I just took a double dose, you know, because I didn't know how, what else to do. And, and I just can't remember the last time I had a headache until just two weeks ago. Sugar cravings greatly diminished. America's addicted to sugar, and though I wasn't, we didn't eat that way, we didn't keep just junky candy bars and Cokes and and Twinkies and donuts in the house. There were certain times of the month, and ladies know what I'm talking about. Chocolate was happening. Could have been 11 o'clock at night. It was going to happen. Brownies, chocolate chip cookies or something. All of this went away. I could have cared less if I had sweets because I was eating this bread, the most perfect complex carbohydrate that God gives us, the food we need for energy, and it's satisfied. So I wasn't constantly craving sugar and sweet things. Uh, my dependence on antihistamines went completely away in just the first month. I lived on antihistamines, had to take antihistamines just to be able to sleep at night, could make it through the day, but I constant had so much congestion and postnasal drip that I could not uh, sleep or breathe at night once I laid my head down. So I had to take antihistamine. That went away in the first month. And I can stand here tonight and tell you, I've been milling my own grain and making my own bread since 1991. So 27 years, I have not had an antihistamine or a decongestant of any kind. Not even last week when I had the flu with the sore throat. It just, it just drained and went away. <laughs> and um, two of my children, the two youngest that are both conceived and born after we started making bread, um, they've never had an antihistamine a single day in their life. And they're 20 six, I have to think, 26 and 22. Now, that's, that right there should be enough to perk your interest up because America's living off of antihistamines, decongestants, allergy medication, laxatives, and Nexium and Prilosec and Advil and ibuprofen, right? So, I just eliminated a whole medicine cabinet. So anyway, this was very exciting to me. One of my children's warts went away. I won't take the time to tell you my long wart story, but I knew it was the bread because um, some of my children had gotten warts before the bread. Through my studies of biochemistry and physiology, I had read about vitamin E being known to get rid of warts. I didn't remember that until multiple visits to the doctor to no avail. We didn't get rid of the warts. They kept them for years. And finally, when I remembered my studies, I started giving them vitamin E and their warts went right away. And then my third child got warts and that was after the bread. A couple of years, we started doing the bread a couple of years later. And um, he couldn't swallow capsules, which is why he's had the warts for a couple of years to take the vitamin E. The bread came into our home and the, vi and the warts were all gone within the month because grains are the most nutrient-rich um, source of food source of vitamin E that we have. No vitamin E capsules was needed for, for him. And you may be kind of laughing, going, okay, now she sounds like, you know, throw some flour over your shoulder, turn around three times, and all your warts will fall off. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about warts are a viral infection. They're a manifestation of a viral infection. And if you do not have enough vitamin E, vitamin E protects the integrity of every cell in your body. And if your cell membrane is weak, then it's uh, more likely to get in, um, be susceptible to invasion by viruses. Viruses, unlike bacteria, have to come into your cell to re reproduce. Bacteria can reproduce on their own. So this invasion of these viruses, which is why we stay so sick with colds and flus and things like that, and warts, and that's why people keep their warts. And it's funny because warts going away is our number one testimony. From 36 warts on a child's hands, his grandmother kept them every day. He didn't really love the bread, so she made chocolate chip cookies out of the freshly milled grain. And in two weeks, 36 warts were gone. The most amazing testimony we have, and we have a video with this woman testifying. She heard me speak at a homeschool show. Her daughter had over 500 warts on her body. She was 17 years old, beautiful young girl, very desperate, though, wanted these warts gone. The mom had been praying. She came into my class, heard me speak. I shared my wart story. Two people shared their wart story in the class. And um, the child had gotten them when she was 12 years old. They had just spread. She had had them completely burned off. 
and because we're treating the symptom there, not getting to the root of the virus. They all, of course, all came back. She had been on multiple medications, and she said, my daughter is 17. They currently have her on ulcer medication because they're saying it must be stress. And she said, I prayed and prayed that God would show me the answer. And she said, I was actually going to another talk, and the Lord told me to come in your room, and I shared the wart information. And so she bought a grain mill, and she said, you know, what have we got to lose? The grain mill costs less than one prescription medication that didn't help any of us, and none of us got to enjoy the flavors and tastes of that medicine. You know, I like to cook. We have to eat. At least we can eat this. So what if, what if it doesn't work? She put, took the grain mill home, and in two and a half weeks, she called. Every wart on that child's body was gone. Two and a half weeks. A lot of times I want to pass over the wart story, but I can't because here's what I want you to understand. Think about that for a minute. If this bread, whole grain, and when I say bread, I'm talking pot of brown rice, black eyed peas and rice, long as brown, uh, biscuits, cornbread, oatmeal, whole grains and beans are what I'm talking about as bread. But what I, what I saw in this is just think about this for a minute. If warts are a manifestation of a virus, and you're keeping that virus for years and years and years, okay, or either months, whatever, if changing to the bread can strengthen your immune system so obviously that warts will go away that quickly, think what it might be doing even if you don't have warts. So that's why I don't want to pass over that testimony because it is powerful. Bread is the Real bread, freshly ground, ground whole grain flour, and you're going to see in just a minute, is the richest food source of vitamin E that God has given us. I became excited. So that was just the first month. Now it's been 20-something years. And when we started our business, we now have thousands of testimonies. People, and that's why my lecture is so long. People would call me and say, my cholesterol dropped 85 points in a month, and all I changed was the bread. And, I, you know, I've been trying to do this for three years on all kinds of medication, and nothing has worked. It's got to be the bread. And that lady, listen, you know what her favorite? I made the bread for her, her favorite thing that I made for her. And she said she had a piece after every meal, it was a cinnamon roll with cream cheese icing, and her cholesterol dropped 85 points in a month. What a pill to swallow, right? I became excited as people came to me, and they were saying the same thing. My constipation's gone, energy level, cholesterol's down, my kids are not getting sick anymore, and guess what? The bread is delicious, and you're just going to have to take my word for it. Come Saturday, and I'll feed you all day pancakes, Reuben bread, sausage bread, garlic rolls, banana muffins. I mean, we'll just feed you, feed you, feed you all day. But I became excited because the bread was delicious. I had studied healthy eating for years and years and years, and there was many things that I would do, like green things that I would drink and all that. My children wouldn't touch it. They were like, no, 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 no. We don't drink things that look like that or taste like that. But the bread, I didn't have to coerce anybody to eat it. And bread, Grains, whole grains are the most nutrient-dense food that God has given us. Remember, Jesus compared himself to bread for a reason. Ounce for ounce, pound for pound, there's more nutritional value in grains than in absolutely any other food out there. Eat the fruits and vegetables. They're very delicious, but we're gonna, I'm going to show you something about that in just a minute. So I became excited. That led to me starting, our, my husband and I starting our business, the Bread Beckers, in 1992. And I began to travel and speak and just share with others about the bread. So let's look at why the, oh, there we go. Why the grains and beans are so nutritious. Now think about with me for just a minute. In Genesis chapter one, it says that in verse 11, it says that God caused the earth to bring forth vegetation. It says that he caused, um, it says the earth sprouted vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit according to its kind whose seed is in them. And then in Genesis, um, then you go on down to Genesis 1, 28, and it says that he, God told them to, uh, I'm sorry, 29, it says, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. Now think about that for just a minute. So two types of things he gave for us. Plants that yield fruit or, veg, you know, fruit of the tree is, can be fruit or vegetable, whatever, that has seed in it. 
very nutritious. Fruits and vegetables, very nutritious, okay? But then he also gave us plants that bear the seed, and it's the seed that is the food for us. Very, very uh, significant difference and a very good reason why God did that because here's the deal. What happens with fruits and vegetables over time? The food that has the seed in it, what happens to it over time? Doesn't take long. If, how many of y'all garden? Tomatoes. Doesn't take long for them to rot and decay, right? And every day, even though they might, may not be visibly rotten every day, you're storing them in your refrigerator, even hanging out on the tree. As they're ripening, they're, there's a peak of nutritional value, and then they start losing, just right there on the tree in your refrigerator, even before they're rotten, okay? But then they eventually rot, correct? Not so with your seeds. Why are seeds so nutritious? Because God created a seed, and this is a kernel of wheat. Um, God created the grains and beans are the seed of the plant, and um, they, he created them with three parts, You've got the bran is the outer layer, and it's several layers thick, full of vitamins, minerals, fiber, a lot of nutritional value in the bran, and many of you have maybe heard of that. But the, what does the bran do to the seed? The bran, several layers thick, left whole and intact, protects the integrity and the life of that seed, Okay. The life of the seed is here in the germ. This is where the sprout is going to come from, okay? This is where the vitamin E lives. This is where the life of the plant, the life of the seed is. This is where fatty acids are. You probably didn't know and think about that grains have fatty acids. All those fatty acids that people are telling you eat more fish and eat more this. Yes, those are good things to eat, but guess what? Grains and beans have them as well. I'm not kidding. Every nutrient that your body needs, with the exception of four, are slightly deficient in wheat. Other seeds have those. And the four are vitamin A, so you need to eat some orange fruits and vegetables. Vitamin C, eat some citrus, and, and most fruits and vegetables have that. Vitamin D, go outside in the sunshine, get some sunshine every day if you can. I know we've had some clouds, but get some sunshine wearing no sunscreen. A little bit, you need that. That's where we get our vitamin D. And then there is one amino acid that is slightly low in, B, in grains. It's lysine. But guess what? God knew what he was doing. Beans have lysine and grains are a little low. So why do you think so many cultures eat beans and rice, beans and cornbread? You know, they make a complete protein. So anyway, God digressed a little bit there, but the germ is where the life comes from. This is where the sprout comes from. Everything else out here is these little packets of protein and starch. And this is known as the endosperm, okay? Now, left whole and intact, seeds are storable. If God didn't create them that way, we wouldn't have next year's crop, right? Fruits and vegetables, rotten decay, seeds do not, as long as you leave them whole and intact. They will be just as nutritious today as they will be next week, Next month, next year, three and 4,000 years from now, as long as you keep them whole, intact, dry. That's why we sell our grain in buckets. <laughs> Here in the Southeast, we need it in a bucket. Dry, bug-proof, rodent-proof, okay? So, whole and intact. In fact, there were tombs in Egypt that were discovered that were believed to be three and 4,000 years old. They found kernels of grain in them. When they planted them, they grew. What does that tell you about those seeds? They're still alive. So the germ is where the life comes from. Everything this plant is ever gonna be or do is here in the germ. The endosperm out here, what did I tell you is? That is protein and starch, that is food for the germinating seed. So when the seed gets wet and the bran begins to break down and then the germ shoots out a little sprout, the food for it is this protein and starch until the germ can, uh, the little sprout can produce roots and leaves to get its um, nutrients from the soil and the sunshine and the rain. Does that make sense? Whole and intact is the way you need to store grains 
and keep grains. Grains are storable. Why do you think God told Joseph to store grains for the lean years that were coming? When Jacob sent his sons down to Egypt, they had food. It wasn't that they didn't have food because he sent them down there with gifts and things. They didn't have grain. Grain is the staff of life. And it's, you, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. And so we kind of take that and go, oh, I need other things. No, he said, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. He was actually reiterating to them, you think just because you have bread, you're alive and you can live. Physically, we could live off of bread alone. Spiritually, we need the real bread of life, Jesus Christ. Okay, now, so where does that leave us? Prior to the 1900s, most of the bread baked in this country was baked at home. People, hmm? The endosperm is protein starch. Oh, yep, better known. The endosperm, hang on. Oh, I've just about got ahead of myself. The endosperm is the white flour portion, okay? In fact, let's put that back up there a minute. So here's your bran. has all the fiber, minerals, vitamins. Um, the germ has your vitamin E and your oils and your life the endosperm, better known to you and I as white flour. Now, left whole and intact, we've established that, storable. What happens when you break this kernel of grain open or you get it wet or whatever? Once I mill my flour, once I crack that grain open, then all these oils, all these fats, all the vitamin E, all the vitamins and minerals are now exposed to the air and a process known as oxidation begins to take place immediately. You've all seen oxidation, right? You've cut an apple and watched it turn dark. You've seen fruits and vegetables ripen, all right? You've cut a banana and watched it turn dark. That's an oxidation process. What you may not see with your eyes is though, oxygen breaks down nutrients. It burns them, it uses them up. So once this kernel of grain is milled into flour and those nutrients and fats and oils are exposed to the air, the oils begin immediately to start breaking down and will go rancid. And then in the first day, I have read that you can lose as much as about 45% of the vitamins and minerals that are there. Fiber is not going to go anywhere. Protein and starch is not going to go anywhere. But the vitamins and minerals can oxidize very rapidly. And in the first um, immediately after grinding this flour is when most of the oxidation takes place. And in just three days, you can have lost as much as 90%. And guess what's going to be one of the first to go? Vitamin E. Because vitamin E is known as an antioxidant. Do you know what that means? It is a nutrient that protects the other nutrients from being destroyed in the presence of oxygen. The best analogy I can give there, it's like the front line of the military, of the arm, of the, of the troops, right? What's the front line doing? Protecting all the guys behind him. Who's the first to go? The front line. So vitamin E is going to be used up very rapidly as it's doing its job of protecting the life of the other nutrients and vitamins and minerals. So now prior to the 1900s, most of the bread baked in this country was baked at home. People were probably clueless that they were losing vitamins and minerals, but they, they knew the flour would spoil. They could smell it, they could taste it, it would go rancid, it would get bugs in it. So they either had the capacity to mill their own grains and mill their own flour at home, or they had local millers. Um, when wind power, animal power, water power was kind of promoted and discovered and used, um, this led to the invention of bigger mills that could, that could use this type of power. And so instead of just a home mill and everybody having to grind just for their family, this took some of that weight off of it. And so towns became built up, communities became built up around the miller. He was a key person in the community because with wind power, water power, or animal power, he could produce more flour than his family needed so he would mill the flour for you. In fact, have y'all ever thought about all the mill roads that we have right here, even in the Atlanta area? I know in our neighborhood, we have Rope Mill Road, Howell Mill Road, Pools Mill Road, Sewell Mill Road. I mean, have you ever thought about what the mill roads were? That was where the mill was. And people, 
the communities were built up around them. But in the late 1800s, it was discovered, hmm, if we sift this very nutrient-rich bran away and the oil-laden germ away and leave only the protein and starch, only the white flour, flour won't spoil. Wow. This was a wonderful discovery, led to the invention of the huge steel rolling mills, big giant rollers that would crush the grain. Bran and germ stays very coarse. The white flour is very fine, would send it through sifters, screens, that would sift the coarse bran out, letting the fine white flour fall. And for the in the, and this all happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The steel rolling mills made white flour and white bread available for the first time in the history of mankind to rich and poor alike by producing massive volumes of this long-lasting white flour. Tell me, wouldn't you go... <laughs> Yay, I don't have to grind flour anymore. In fact, I remember Brad's 90-something, you know, grandfather lived with us, and I'd be in the kitchen, turn my mill on, and I'd grind corn for cornbread or wheat for wheat bread, whatever, and I'd be grinding that. And he goes, he sat over in a chair, and he goes, just like this, he goes, I ground a lot of corn in my day, <laughs> just like that. And I'm, can you imagine in the 1900s going, yay, especially when families were larger? I mean, if I, you know, Knowing what I know now, I'd do it this way if I had to, but I do love my electric mill because when my kids were all at home, we went through about 50 pounds a month of flour. So that's a lot of grinding every day. So yeah, I probably would have gone, yay, I don't have to do this anymore. The steel rolling mills came on the scene, producing massive volumes of this wonderful white flour that made fluffier bread, no more coarse grain, no more, I mean, bran and germ, and no more having to mill it myself or even go to the local millers. Local millers went out of business. The mills moved out to the wheat field. That's why you drive down these mill roads and you don't see any mills. You might go up to Helen and see one by the, the water there in Helen, Georgia. There's Nora Mills, I think. But that's why you don't see them anymore. They're all out west at the wheat fields um, where the hard wheat is grown. So, but guess what happened? Three diseases became epidemic when the white flower came on the scene. Because what you have to realize is white flower has always been around, okay? It was back in the days of the Romans, back in the days of Egyptians. They had it. They figured out right away if they made screens out of papyrus leaves or whatever, they could sift the coarser bran and germ out, and the white flower would make fluffier, softer bread, okay? But only the wealthy could have that. The only the wealthy had servants, bakers that could take the time to sift that bran and germ out to make white bread and fluffier white things for the kings and the wealthy and the royalty. The peasants and the poor people still ate the coarse, which I think is funny because now you pay extra money probably to get peasant bread or harvest bread or multi-grain bread, which is not what you think. But anyway, you know, do you see what we're saying? But the poor people of that day looked on with envy at the wealthy, their white bread. In fact, in Rome, the wealth and the status of your family was determined by how white your bread was, or your poor status was determined by how brown it was, okay? Because two things that were happening here, number one, the poor could not afford to, um, they, didn't, they didn't have the time or the energy to do that. They just had to eat what they, what they did, what they ground. But the other thing was they couldn't afford to lose that much of their food. 25% of your grain is the bran and the germ. The white flour is 75%. So think about it. For every 100 pounds of grain, you're going to only come up with 75 pounds of flour if you're sifting the bran and germ out, right? Okay? So only the wealthy, the royalty had this. Have you ever thought about this scripture, Proverbs 23? You probably never have like I have. Verse 1, it says this, Be careful when you sit down to the king's table. Do not crave his dainties and his delicacies, it says. They are deceitful food. Have you ever thought about what that is? 
delicacies, dainties. I used to think it was probably food offered to idols. No, not anymore. I think it's white flower fluffy things. That's what I think dainties and delicacies are. Do you remember, how many of y'all remember your grandmother gave you her cake recipes and what did it say in there? Sift the flour, it makes a fluffier, lighter cake. And I remember when we were first married, I had a sifter, I had my grandma, I still have my grandmother's sifter, and I was sifting the white flour. I didn't know it was already sifted, but see, grandmother's recipes came from her mother, who came from her mother, before they sifted the bran and germ out. So grandma was sifting the bran and germ out so it would make white flour fluffy things, better cakes and cookies. Does that make sense to you now? So steel rolling mills started sifting the bran and germ away, But now, white bread, white flour, instead of just being the wealthy that was sick because they had the white bread, America is sick. Epidemic, three diseases, beriberi. So vitamin B1 deficiency results in nervous disorders. Pellagra is a vitamin B3 deficiency. B3 is niacin. Some of you may have heard B3 is for the heart as well. But pellagra was a GI problem, and it resulted in just um, GI disturbances, skin eruptions, skin issues, mental insanity. In fact, it was known as the disease of the four Ds, dysentery, dermatitis, dementia, and death. And I, one of the research um, papers that I read said the southeastern United States was particularly plagued by pellagra. In fact, the first case of pellagra was... Um, diagnosed in 19, I never can remember if it's 02 or 07, but somewhere right in there, um, in Atlanta, Georgia, they had never seen pellagra before. And in the first year, they saw 30,000 cases. And the article said that it, Georgia and South Carolina are particularly plagued by pellagra, so much so that mental institutions were literally overflowing. They did not have enough beds to house the patients patients. And when we first started our business, I actually met a woman that said her mother died in a mental institution of pellagra. I am talking epidemic in this country. We hear things, oh, it's epidemic. You're like, I don't know anybody. No, it was a widespread national problem. And then anemia was the third disease that these puzzled health officials all over our country, and they eventually traced the problem to the missing nutrients from our grains. They went to the millers, said, put the bran and germ back in. We've got these diseases. We've got to correct this problem. But the millers said, no, (laughs) we're not going to do that. Because that 25% of the bran and germ that they were getting from the flour, they weren't throwing it away. They were selling it to the cattle feed industry, and it is still being done today. They still sell it to the cattle industry to make cattle feed. So the bran and germ is very lucrative market for them. And they're like, we're not giving this up. Okay. So, and this was really funny. Uh, I went to, on one of my trips to Haiti in January. um, And in 2016, when I started the ministry there, they had asked me to come there because the pastors had heard me teach and speak. And they're like, the kids are coming to school with no food and they're starving and we can't afford to feed them but if we could give them one roll, that would be better than anything, white rice or whatever we could attempt to feed them and much cheaper. And so that's what I, I went over there and started doing that. But the boys and the young men that I trained, I taught them this. I showed them the history of white flour and told them how they sift the bran and germ out. Well, so I've been going there now for a year and a half, two years. And then in January, this past January, when I went, I was in the market with one of the young men and I was walking down the the street there and there was this big like 50 pound sack this big around about this tall and um it had the top rolled back and a can sitting in the top of it and when I looked at it it looked just like bran and germ you know you know kind of brown and coarse and I'm like what is this and the young man speaks limited English and I don't speak any Creole and he looked at me and he goes you know and I'm like no why I'm asking you what is this and he goes you know the stuff they take out of the flower and I'm like, what, why are they, what are they selling it for? What's it here? And he goes, it's pig feed. Pig feed. And I'm like, are you kidding me? The whole country is starving to death and you're feeding the bran and germ to the pigs. 
And so that was in January, and it was so funny. Uh, I just got back in September, and the lady that was on the trip that had headed up the trip this time, she really wanted me to teach um, the nannies um, because I had taught the pastors, and, you know, so we were just making breaks. She wanted the nannies to understand this. So I'd go over the history of white flour, and, and then I, and I had a little sifter there, and I took the flour just like that, and I had said they sift the bran and germ out, and one of them said, well, what do they do with it? And I said, oh, I'm about to tell you. And, I said, and then I told him, I said, they sell it as animal feed. And when I walked over to the one lady and she saw that brand and germ, she knew immediately what it was. And all of a sudden, these six ladies and my translator start talking Creole. And I know nothing of what they're talking about. And they're laughing. Their eyes were about this big. And finally, I looked at the translator and I said, what are they saying? He goes, they just, and I hadn't said, I didn't tell him the story about seeing the pig feed in the market. They said, they just figured out why the pigs are fat and healthy in Haiti and the people are not. And I'm like, Enough said, I don't need to go on. But here, that's the deal. So we're feeding the bran and the germ, the most nutritious part of the bread to the animals and the protein and starch to the people. Epidemic disease spreads. Urge the millers to put the bran and germ back in. No, we can't do that. So guess what happens? In 1948, our government steps in and mandates that the bread be, that the flour be enriched. Now, as a food scientist, when I read that word and studied that word, I thought they were doing us a favor. They were making it better. Doesn't that what, isn't that what enriched means? That they were making it better than it would have been had they not done that. For the 35 to 40 nutrients that are lost when the bran and germ is removed, they put four back in and call it enriched. Three B vitamins and iron. And supposedly, that took care of beriberi, pellagra, and anemia. But I must ask you this question. How many nervous disorders do we have in our country today? How many GI disturbances do we have in our country today? How many skin eruptions? mental insanity. We're going crazy, okay? And anemia as well. So I don't think it has correct the problem. So that was in 1948. You ready for this? 50 years later, 1998, mandated that they add one more back in there. You know what that one is? You ever heard of folic acid? And do you know why they told them to put it back in? because for 50 years, they watched birth defects go up and up and up because of the missing folic acid that we were no longer getting from God's perfect provision. This is, this is huge. And if that were not enough, because of oxidation, the residual oils that are mixed in with the flour that they can't quite get out, they turn yellow so we need to bleach it. And a product, you should have seen the nanny's eyes when I said that. And, and I, cause I looked at them and I said, they bleached the flour. And I said, what do you bleach your white clothes with? And all of a sudden one of them went and just went, we never want to eat this bread again. <laughs> they never want to eat white bread again. A product called nitrogen trichloride was used for more than 25 years, but they finally took it off the market because it caused the running fits and seizures in dogs. So imagine what it might be doing in people. But a chlorine derivative is still used. Benzoyl peroxide um, can be used to treat the flour. Um, potassium bromate, all these are used. They're gases that the flour is exposed to, and that's why you might not see it on the label. Very detrimental health effects from that. Isaiah 55 verse 2 says this. First of all, Proverbs 14, 12. I can never do this part without thinking about that verse. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. And Isaiah 55 verse 2 says this, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your earnings for what does not satisfy? When I read this in that first journal that I received in 1991, my eyes were opened. 
and I went, what I'm feeding my family is not bread. And in Haggai chapter 1 and other places in Scripture, God says, consider your ways, how you've fared. Have you ever read Scriptures like that? Uh, paraphrasing to teenagers, how's that working for you? And that's what I say. Um, but in, I love Haggai because it says this. Um, I recently heard someone speak, and he says like 90% of the American um, food dollar goes to junky processed food. We spend very little in America on real food. And in Haggai, it says, consider your ways and how you have fared. You sow much, but you reap little. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you earn wages to put them in a bag with holes in it. When I read that, I cannot help but think, here we're spending and working to earn wages and spending 90% of that on stuff that we are calling food that is making us sick. So where's the rest of our money going? There's a medical care crisis in our country. We're staying sick and sick, and money is just going out this bag with holes in it. I'll never forget a, a lady came. We, we did homeschool shows, and she heard me speak, and uh, she came up to the table, and she bought a meal after she had heard this, and she said, I, I can't wait to do this. She came back the next year, and she, was, she came to buy the $500 mixer. And, uh, she, and this lady was standing there, and she was trying to decide if she was going to buy it or not and was trying to decide what she wanted. And the lady said, well, step aside. I know what I want. And she said, I'm getting the mixer this year. Last year, I bought the grain mill, and she goes, and she, and she did this. She made this motion, and she goes, I made room on my counter because I could dumped all my medicine in the trash can. I no longer have to take all that stuff. Now, I'm not going to say you can get rid of all your medicine and stuff. I'm just telling you what this lady said, and I've heard it time and time again. I'm not sick anymore. If I'm sick, I mean, I just had the flu, but people go, call, did you go to the doctor? I'm like, no, I'll be well. I'm getting over it. I'm fine, you know. Now, this one was a nasty one, and it took me a little while to get over it but I have a strong immune system that can get over things. But heart disease, cancer, diabetes, these are all things that whole grains have been proven that they reduce the risk of these diseases, yet it's plaguing America. All right, I've got 30 minutes. I'm going to get to talk about my favorite subject and one I am sure you have never heard discussed in church before. We got to go to constipation, okay? And we're just going to hang out in the bowels for a few minutes. And Brad says, well, every, <laughs> he tells me I get stuck in the bowels. And I'm like, well, everybody, everything else does. So we'll just go with it. But anyway, so let's talk about constipation for just a minute and understand what elimination is and what the bowels are and what this is supposed to be doing. It's basic to a whole host of problems. And unlike these diseases that are directly related to the nutrients being removed from our flour, constipation is directly related to the fiber that is found in the bran and germ and whole grains are one of the richest sources of insoluble fiber and that is all removed. And now Americans eat very, very, very little foods with fiber in it. Fruits and vegetables do have some fiber, and they're good. They have something called soluble fiber, which does great things for softening the stool, but you need the bulking of um, insoluble fiber. So we're going to leave here tonight knowing absolutely what fiber is and what it does in your body. And I know you're just like, woohoo, I can't wait. Three functions of fiber. Okay, you ready for this? In case you've laid awake at night wondering. All right. Number one, fiber increases the bulk of your stool. Number two, fiber softens your stool. And number three, this is my very personal favorite way of putting this, and I am convinced that my very southern mother came up with this terminology. It shortens your transit time. Did you hear that? It shortens your transit time. That's the number three function of fiber. In other words, you poop more often, okay? So you don't go days without going. So fiber increases the bulk of the stool, softens the stool, 
and shortens your transit time, okay? How does it do this? We are fearfully and wonderfully made, all right? And if you're just like going, why do we really have to go here? Just hang with me a minute, and you're going to see why a lot of the things that I told you I experienced in the first month directly related to this. All right, so first I'm going to go over how we're supposed to work. We eat food that has fiber in it. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, I need to tell y'all, I'm a science major, not at all an art major. So none of this is going to be anatomically correct. Steve asked me, he goes, we can do PowerPoint. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm, that's, that's way beyond me. I just will stick to my drawings, which is funny because I can't even draw a stick figure. So I probably need to tell you what this is, esophagus and stomach. You all right with that? Okay, so just use your imagination. So we eat food. Now, this is the way we're supposed to work. Remember, God caused the earth to bring forth food for us, trees that bear fruit, trees that have bear seeds, okay? Fruits and vegetables, seeds loaded with fiber. So we need to eat them, okay? As close to the way as God created as possible. Eat the apple instead of the apple-flavored fruit bar, okay? Eat the grains instead of a Twinkie. Our, yeah, anyway, we're not going to go there. Okay, so we're going to eat food here. Now, we need to chew our food. You need to chew your food. Carbohydrate digestion begins in your mouth. As you chew your food, you mix it with saliva, and there's an enzyme called amylase that immediately begins to break those carbohydrates down. And if you chew your food long enough, you'll realize that it actually gets sweeter as you chew it. So chew your food. So we swallow this puree that we've already started chewing, comes down here into our stomach. In case you didn't know what that was, that's your stomach. Now here's something that most people don't understand. Carbohydrate digestion stops for all practical purposes in your stomach because carbohydrate digesting enzymes work in an alkaline environment. Protein digestion begins here. Protein digestion needs an acid environment. Protein digestive enzymes must have an acid. So the stomach, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's no way people can say we do not have an intelligently designed body because our stomach not only has cells that begin to produce acid that bring the pH of your stomach down to three, and if those of you don't understand that, that's very acid. It could eat a hole in this counter or this wood, whatever. Very, very, very acidic. God knew what he was doing. We have cells that produce this mucus lining that protects the walls of our stomach so protein digestion can happen here. Then once this is done and pureed, what we swallowed, this substance, this puree that we've produced called chyme is taken over and shot through the small intestines, several feet of the small intestines. This is where your pancreas enzymes then come here are dumped in the small intestines. Your gallbladder produces bile that's not an enzyme, but it is an emulsifier and helps fat digestion. These are dumped in your small intestines, and this is where the individual nutrients are finished breaking down, and nutrient absorption takes place through the walls of your small intestine and eventually ends up in your bloodstream and to the cells where they're needed. Okay, <clears throat> as this chyme passes through, the undigested fiber, that bran fiber, that insoluble fiber that's found in the bran and germ that can't be digested here, can't be digested here, can't be digested here. And for years, people thought it had no nutritional value because it wasn't digested. What they didn't know is what it's doing is drawing toxins and the stuff that your body goes, I don't know what that is, don't need it, that's not a nutrient. That fiber attracts it to it, and this gets dumped over here in your big trash can known as your large intestine or your colon, okay? Now, what begins to happen here? How many of you have a lot of information out now? Good bacteria, good organisms, gut flora, probiotics, whatever you want to call them. As a food microbiologist, oh my gosh, I could talk hours on just that subject alone. So important, these gut organisms. Again, fearfully and wonderfully made. We are supposed to have more organisms living right here in our gut than cells in our body, than people in the world, in our gut. And what do they do? They begin to feed 
on this undigested fiber. That is its food. So it's broken down in the large intestine, and these organisms, through this feeding process, produce massive amounts of B vitamins. You know what B vitamins are known for? Energy, nervous disorders, skin, insanity, you know, uh, mental clarity, not insanity. B vitamins, without which this going on in your body, you could eat the most perfect diet in the world. You would never get enough B vitamins. You must have this going on here. Vitamin K, enzymes, guess what? Antibiotics. They don't want bad guys living in there either. So they protect themselves, and in doing that, they protect you. And then a big, big player's. This is known as gut fermentation. You probably heard it. <laughs> gut fermentation, they produce things called ferulic acid, butyric acid. Studies being done today are discovering these have powerful anti-carcinogenic properties. All going on in your gut if you have two things going on there. Fiber from your grains and organisms, all right? So that needs to happen. All right, but let's go back to our, our fiber, all right? So three functions of fiber. What happens? The, the, the uh, chyme gets dumped there. So look what happens. We've eaten solid food and turned it into a liquid, and we've dumped it over here as a liquid. Now we have to eliminate it as a solid waste. The large intestine does this through a series of peristaltic motion. It begins to contract, relax, contract, relax. And some of you may have seen that commercial. There's a laxative commercial that's um, about fiber. They're, they're touting that their laxative has fiber in it. And I'm like, why don't you just eat a roll? It tastes better, you know. But anyway, so it shows you, have you seen that? It shows you sticking the little sponge down the glass and how it can absorb all that water. Best analogy ever, fiber is like a sponge. In fact, wheat fiber, I think, can absorb 10 times its weight in water. Fiber is very much like a sponge. So if I come in and my sponge sitting on my kitchen sink is all dry and shriveled up, what's the first thing I'm going to do if I want to use it? I'm going to put it down in water, and what's going to happen? It's going to absorb that water, and it swells, okay? Number one function of fiber. You just saw it, heard it right there. Increase, you didn't see it, but increases the bulk of your stool. So the sponge gets bigger, right? Okay, dry, shriveled up sponge. I want to use it. I want to clean something maybe with an opening this big. Sponge is dry and shriveled up. Can't go in there, right? Okay, so what do I do? Put the sponge down in water. It absorbs the water. Now it's bigger. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Yeah, it's soft, so can very easily pass through an orifice this big. Though it's bulkier, it's soft. Very, very, very important, okay? Third function of fiber. We got to shorten your transit time, okay? It should not be five days before you go to the bathroom and eliminate, okay? One good bowel movement a day is the absolute minimum. If you are not going that much, if you eat one time a day, one time a day is what you should go. If you eat three times a day, you should go three times a day, all right? And if you're not going that much, then you're constipated. Just, just wanted to tell you that, all right? So we need to shorten your transit time. So you only have the urge to eliminate when the colon is full. And I know y'all are starting to look like, why are we really talking about this at church tonight? Okay, I'm going to get there, all right? You only have the urge to eliminate when the colon is full. So when you eat food that has fiber in it and it absorbs that water, it increases the bulk of the stool, puts pressure on the walls of the colon, stimulates the colon to go like this, and that's the feeling when you go, stop the car, I'll be right back, excuse me, right? You, that's how you know you got to go, right? So you have the urge to eliminate one good bowel movement a day is the absolute minimum you should be going. What is this that we're eliminating? Toxins, trash, Things the body said, I don't want you in there, okay? Take out the trash, just like we throw trash in the trash can. We don't want this. Get it out, okay? Now, before we move on, I need to tell you about the green side of the sponge, okay? This, I love this 
as my, my picture, my visual aid here, because grain fiber is quite unique from other fibers. Like I said, fruits and vegetables have fiber, but grain fiber has fiber that's mildly abrasive. And so as you go to eliminate, and this is passing down and out, it scrubs your colon clean. Okay, very, very important. All right, so real quick, let's look at how America works. And this is going to make everything make so much sense here. And I can do this fast because now we've laid the groundwork here. All right, so first of all, we eat food completely devoid of fiber. We don't chew it because nine times out of 10, we're in the drive-thru and we're chunking burgers to the back of the car and trying to sip and talk on the phone and eat our food all at the same time, right? Have you ever done that? Yep, you shake your head, you know you have. So anyway, we don't chew our food and our food gets dumped down here in the stomach. So we've already inhibited digestion here because we're not chewing very well. And the food we're eating is devoid of enzymes as well. But it comes down here, and now we need to digest the proteins. But herein lies a problem, okay? Protein digestion takes place here in your stomach. And what did I say you need to digest proteins? What, do, what kind of environment? Acid environment. Do you all know what one of the number one medications in America is after laxatives? Nylon, pri, oh, Nylosec, Nexium and Prilosec, antacids. What are you doing? You've already got a digestive problem if you're having heartburn and acid reflux and these issues. And taking these antacids is causing protein digestion to be even more limited. And let me just say something here. The, tech, the term, the definition of an allergy... Okay, the definition of an allergy is the inability to digest a protein. Why in the world are we seeing so many allergies today? People are allergic to everything. Now, we're going to get to the gut organisms because that's a huge player too. But, and, and I'm not meaning to oversimplify, and I am not a doctor. I'm not diagnosing but you, we got to start thinking about, I will bless your bread and I will bless your water and I will take sickness from the midst of you. How did we get here? How did we become the sickest nation in the world? How is that possible Though we're the wealthiest nation in the world? I go to Haiti. They eat this bread. Nobody asks me if it's gluten-free. Nobody. Not a single kid has ever had an allergic reaction. And we take peanut butter. And nobody's allergic to peanut butter. They don't keep peanut butter from coming to the school. And somebody asked me how I get around the health requirements of the bread. I'm like, uh, you need to come to Haiti. There's no, yeah, mm -mm. no. They're just bring the food, whatever, you know. There's none. Why? Now, they're starving. They have other communicable diseases like cholera and things like that. But let me tell you something. There's, there's not allergies. These kids are much healthier than American children, much healthier. Their teeth, perfectly straight. And I promise you, none of them have been to an orthodontist, not in the orphanages where I'm working. It's amazing. Why? Because they're not on the Prilosec, the Nexium, the Advil, the antibiotics that are just dished out, dished out, dished out. Anyway, okay, back to our time. So... Just think about these things and think about what we're doing. All right, so this chyme is shunted over here into our small intestines. Okay. Now, unfortunately, do you remember what I said with the bread? Taking the bran and germ out takes about 35 to 40 nutrients out of that food and leaves us with virtually protein and starch. So what do you think might be happening to the other food that's all processed and colored and flavored and sugared and... Some of it, Brad and I went to the um, Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, Illinois, and there was this little, little, uh, little exhibit there, and it was the, the, 
the chemistry department, the chef was do 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 making coconut cream pie. And the end came out with this brand name of coconut cream pie. There was no coconut. There was no cream. There was, there was a pie, but there was no food in it. We're eating things that aren't even that, okay? So we're eating food that's completely devoid of nutrients. What few nutrients there are get absorbed through the walls of our small intestines. And this is why we crave food. We never satisfied. Go to an all-you-can-eat. You unbutton your pants and you're still circling to, you know, try to find, because you're not satisfied. Or you walk in the back door and you're like, I just want something because you're not satisfied. Why? Because of stuff that we're eating that we're calling food is not what God gave us. It's what we've altered and changed for convenience. And it's so devoid of nutrients, we are never satisfied. Yet Jesus says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall be satisfied. Grains fill you up. Fiber fills you up, so not only is it giving you just about every nutrient, vitamin you need, the fiber fills you up. You know you've eaten when you eat a piece of bread, and I'm telling you, you can't overeat it. So, we're devoid of fiber as this chyme shoots through here, and many of us don't have a gallbladder, and our pancreas over here, because of the high sugar we're eating, this is the same organ that is producing insulin, if you can't produce enough insulin, do you think you might have trouble producing the digestive enzymes that you need? It's overworked and underpaid. So we got a digestive issue going on. Now, all this stuff, these chemical toxins that are now in our stuff we call food, should be attracted to our toxin magnet fiber. But there's none of that there either. But this garbage is dumped over here in our large intestine known as a colon. Okay, now what did I tell you is supposed to happen over here? These good organisms are supposed to feed on what? Fiber. There is none. But guess what else? There's none of these guys either because we take so many antibiotics. We have become germaphobes in this country. Let me tell you, go to Haiti. Oh my goodness. You just, you just need to see. <laughs> and we, we're not thinking about not only are we taking oral antibiotics so often, and there is a time and place for them. I praise God for them for some, for some things. But just every time, every time taking an antibiotic, and here's something that you may not have thought about, all the hand sanitizers that we're using and the antibacterial soaps. Please, please, please think about this transdermal absorption is so much stronger than taking it by mouth. So you are taking antibiotics every time you sanitize your hands, every time. And, and that's powerful. I mean, you got to think about this. So if we, if we kill these guys and don't feed these guys and don't replenish these guys. We're the only ethnic group in the world that does not eat a cultured or fermented food on a regular basis. We used to, America, we used to have raw milk and sour cream and buttermilk and real fresh butter that had those organisms in it. But all of that is pasteurized now. And then we're not a culture that eats sauerkraut and kimchi and, and fermented drinks and things like that. But we need to be. So important to get those organisms back in there. All right, so now let's contract, relax, contract, relax, draw water in. Oh, right, yep, sorry. Thank you, Brad. So now we've lost our B vitamins, remember? Those good organisms feeding on that fiber. We've lost that. We've lost our vitamin K. We've lost those antibiotics that it produces. We've lost the ferulic acid, the butyric acid. We're losing here, all right? And any one, a deficiency of any one of these B vitamins, I read in a Christian physiology book, never learned this in college, and all my physiology I took in high school and college, never learned this till I taught physiology to my children. And this author said, this is a very unique relationship that God put here, and without which we can never get enough B vitamins from a perfect diet. And he said, a deficiency of any one of those B vitamins causes a problem known as chronic fatigue syndrome. Big popular thing back in the 90s. 
Some of y'all are too young to remember that. But remember, it was Epstein Barr and chronic fatigue. That was everybody had that. Now it's uh, celiac disease. Every you know. Anyway, do you remember what I told you? First thing I noticed after constipation was gone. Energy. I had more energy. And at first, I thought it was just the B vitamins in the food that I was eating, but then I realized it was that and this going on here. Energy. I had more energy. All right. Contract, relax, contract, relax. There's no sponge there. So guess what's going to happen? The colon's going to let the water back out. There's nothing there to absorb it. So guess what happens? You don't wet this stuff. What happens? Dry and shriveled up. So you eat breakfast today, lunch today, dinner today, no urge to eliminate. Breakfast tomorrow, lunch tomorrow, you, read, you with me? No urge to eliminate. Third day, national average. Don't ask me how they found out. Three to four days, people go. And let me just tell you something. When I was growing up, it was considered an old person's problem. Okay, my mother drank prune juice and Roma meal bread. That was how she fixed that problem. But it is no longer an old person's problem. I cannot tell you how many moms have written me saying their four-year-olds would go days without eliminating. Take them to the doctor, medication. And one mom said she looked at the doctor, and she it was a pediatrician, and she goes, he's only four. Is, is this medication okay? And he goes, oh, yes, no problem. I have thousands of children on this. One mom was told constipation is just the way of things these days. There's nothing you can do about it. And somebody gave her a loaf of bread that they had made from freshly ground flour, and the child pooped that day. And she became a believer. And this mom, tears pouring down her face, looked at me and said, you saved my child. Two-year-old, hospitalized. His bowels were impacted. Two. I've changed the diaper of a baby with hemorrhoids. Okay? This is a serious Serious problem, and it doesn't have to be that way. So now we go three, four, five days, we know something's wrong, okay? So we go, I'm going in, and I'm not coming out till something happens, right? And that's why we have book racks in the bathroom, because it's no urge to eliminate, so you're going to be in there for a while, all right? And it's not soft does not easily pass through an orifice this big. So you push, you strain, you rip, you tear, you pull hemorrhoids, fissures, you blow little balloons in the walls of your colon, known as diverticuli. I love the Latin word, diverticuli. You know what it means? The Latin root, it means a wayside house of ill frame. Huh. These are little houses that aren't supposed to be there, and now you have a door. And this stuff gets packed in here because it's sitting there for days. Now you got it in little openings, cesspools, breeding ground for infection. Whoops, I think it's over here. <laughs> and now if you can't keep it under control with laxative stool softeners and antibiotics, they'll go in there and cut that part of your colon out. One out of three people in America have this issue. Please, please, please let me tell you something. Don't let anybody tell you you have feet of colon so you don't need this little foot that they're going to cut out. Oh, no, 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 no. Different things happen different places along both your small and your large intestine. Different nutrients, different things going on. It's important that that doesn't happen. And nobody tells you how you got here. Guess what? They're just going to move on down here. If you continue to be constipated, if you don't change what's happening. So day after day, week after week, month after month, we live with trash that was supposed to be taken out. What is this? Toxins. What happens if toxins just sit there, just like in your home? The trash just sits there, it starts stinking up everything else, right? These toxins get absorbed through the walls of the large intestine, get into the lymph system, the blood system, and the body's response of toxins 
is to, one of the responses is to make mucus so you can blow it out your nose. So if you are chronically congested like I was, the problem could be, might be, as simple as this. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Because let me tell you, now you got toxins here, you got toxins here, and what do we do if we have snotty nose and congestion? What did I do? Antihistamine. What does that do? Dries it up right here. Doesn't get rid of the toxin. So now, <laughs> big guys start to take over. Your adrenal system, your immune system starts trying to just take out the trash and deal with these toxins. And now a virus comes along whose manifestation of, is warts, and you're going to get it and you're going to keep it. Your coworker coughs on you. You're going to get it and you're going to keep it. Your child comes home from school with a throwing up virus. You're going to get it and everybody in the family is going to get it. Okay? God never intended us to live this way. Doesn't mean we'll never get sick again. I'm not saying that. Doesn't mean you might not. Because, listen, as surely as we're physical, we're spiritual. And as surely as we're spiritual, we're physical. And I have a whole nother testimony. I can come back sometime. The spiritual roots of disease. And those are big players too. But listen to this. Listen to me. One of, I find bread scriptures anywhere. But this is one of my favorites. Trudging along every year, you start with Genesis, right? Y'all try to read through the Bible every year? Okay, I do. I try. So get to Deuteronomy. And you're like, six Leviticus numbers. Deuteronomy again. And you're trudging through, trudging through. But I'm going to tell you, my eyes lit up. I hit chapter 24. I, like I said, I find bread scriptures anywhere. This chapter 24 in Deuteronomy, verse 6, well, the previous verses is talking about um, doing business. You know, God has laws, you know, and it, they're not legalistic things. They're, this is the best way to live and do for a reason. Well, in those days, if you were going to borrow something from me, you would leave me something of value as a pledge that you would pay me back. So you come to borrow something from me, and you give me something of yours that's value, and I keep it until you pay me back. Listen to this law. God says in Deuteronomy 24, verse 6, Do not take a man's upper millstone as a pledge, for you would be taking his life. Did you ever see that verse? I hadn't for many years, and I only saw it just a, a good many years ago, but way into. Did you hear what that said? God equates the mill with your life. And look what we did. In 1900, we let someone take our millstones out of our home for money, for convenience, for whatever, and we were willing. And they've been taking our life ever since. This is a real, real problem. Yet God says, I will bless your bread, and I will bless your water, and I will take sickness from the midst of you. If you obey. It says, if you obey. That's right. And I want to I, I don't want to go over too much, but I do want to share one last verse with you that God showed me just a few, um, la a year ago. It's 1 Timothy 4. I saw something here that I had just never seen before because I want to tell you something. How many of you have read books like Wheat Belly and you're hearing, oh, I'm gluten insensitive and I'm gluten intolerant and grains are bad and bread is bad and bread makes you fat? Listen, the stuff in the store does. We've already said that. We've already determined that. That is not bread. That is not what Brad, what Brad, what Jesus compared himself to, to, to. In fact, if you talk to Brad, he'll tell you it's the Antichrist. So anyway, um, <clears throat> but I um, found this verse. Well, you know it. It's uh, 1 Timothy. Sorry, I'm like, I can't find it. 1 Timothy. This just leapt off the page at me. We are, for a hundred years, we've been eating dead bread, okay? All the life been taken out. In fact, 
we sifted the bran and germ out, right? Do you remember when Jesus was about to die and he looked at Peter and says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. We don't sift wheat, you sift flour. And he was saying, and I thought about this today, he was saying to Peter, Satan wants to remove everything that's valuable to you and leave you as a worthless lump of white flour. <laughs> that's my translation. But anyway, that, that's what he's saying there. He wants to sift you as wheat. They sifted flour, and Peter knew exactly what he was talking about. And so for 100 years, we've been eating this dead bread that is making us fat, has made us sick, has made us all these things. Diabetic, heart disease. Heart disease was not an issue till bread started being, uh, white bread came on the market. It just wasn't. A few isolated cases, but it wasn't there. So we've been eating this bread for 100 years. And now we're sick and fat. But listen to this. In the last days, it says, and I don't know where you are in your time scheme of things, and I don't necessarily want to get there, but we obviously are into some interesting days. It says that um, the Holy Spirit declares that in the last days, some will turn away from the faith, paying attention instead to deceitful and seductive spirits and doctrines of demons, misled by the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared with a branding iron, leaving them in, uh, I'm sorry, I do the amplified and it's way too much information, but anyway, who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from certain kinds of food which God has created. Most of us stop there. Listen to the rest. It says, which God has created to be gratefully shared by those who believe. Listen, you can cook one piece of meat. You can eat, you can cook one piece of meat. You can eat an apple all by yourself. You can eat a banana, you can fix some broccoli. But I'm here tonight to tell you, you can't make one roll. You can't make just one muffin. Bread was created by God to be shared to be stored for difficult times that are coming. Even, listen to this, even the word companion. Do you know what it means? Do you know what the Latin word is there? Pan is bread and calm is with. Your companion is with bread. And do you see what the enemy is going to try to do to us? He's going to first tell us bread is terrible, bread is ugly, bread will make you fat. So now we go out and say, Jesus is the bread of life. And they go, oh, no, that's bad. Bread is bad. Bread makes you fat. Bread makes you, I can't eat bread. It has to have all. And then that was food that is to be shared. So don't let someone take your life and take away the very calling that God has called us to is to share the real bread of life with others. So, sorry I went over, um, and I, you already gave me extra time, but thank you so much. I hope you're encouraged. Go on our website. I, I know you're like, I don't even know now what to do. Go on our website. Come to our class. Um, call me. I'll help you. Call I'm Steve. <laughs> so, um, I just love you. Thank you so much for having me here, and God bless you all. for our special series, Walking with God. We want to give you an opportunity as we do in our service right now. People are receiving Jesus as their personal savior. And we want you to just stop what you're doing, pause where you are, open your heart to this reality. God loves you. He has an awesome plan for your life. He knew you before you were in the womb and he created you, listen to this, to be with him. Well, how do I do that, Steve? How does that work? It's so simple. He's made it simple for us. And that's why faith is so critical. It levels all of the, the places in our life. And it gives every individual an opportunity. Here's what he says. 
if you believe you have everlasting life. And so here's how it begins. It's a conversation with God. We call that prayer. You would simply say something like, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I have sinned, though I can't name them all. I ask you to forgive me. Save me. Change me. From this day forward, I'll never be the same. Now, help me live my life, this new life that you've given me, for you, in Jesus' name. It is that real. And with that prayer, what you've done is you have repented, you have cried out to God. It's Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made into righteousness, and with the heart, we believe and are saved. I'd love to send you a book. It's called our ebook, Life at the Side of Jesus. And it's a 21 day journey. We talk to you and help you learn to read the Bible and pray. And then your next step, of course, is water baptism. So if you'll communicate with us, go to our Facebook page, send me an email. My personal email is gonna be on this video. You can send me an email, we'll respond and shoot that out to you. You can send it in a PDF or in a Word document. We love you, God bless you, see you next time.